So we talked about innovation and why it was important. I want to talk a little bit about innovation and, and innovation management. Um, and it's brief, right? So this is a, typically if you want to learn about innovation, it's, it's a whole course, let alone a half an hour lecture. And tell me what you think innovation is. So a lot of people, if I go to the universities, they say, it's R&D. <laughs> innovation is not R&D. This is, this is the definition I use in simple terms. The creation and delivery of something new, it's that customer's value. Customer can be whoever is a user. And with a sustainable business model. Because there are many good ideas that have not a sustainable business model and therefore never get used. Keywords, creation and delivery, adding value, sustainable business. Most universities do not practice innovation. They, they, they research what is important to the researchers and what they can publish. <laughs> and this is something that has to change. So a global innovation economy is emerging though. We're seeing unexpected opportunities. We see exponential growth, massive competition, and traditional business models being turned upside down. And we're going to talk about some of those. Transportation. When, when the transportation, vehicular transportation came, we bought cars, we drove them. Then in urbanisation, we realised parking is difficult, we take a taxi. So taxis were attacking vehicle ownership and, and the business model. And suddenly, Uber drivers are challenging the business model of a taxi. But then batteries start to get better. Not good enough for long-term energy storage for household electricity, but good enough for motor vehicles. And along comes Tesla and really challenging the conventional industry as well. I'll talk about demand life cycle for new products. So when we first have this idea, we, we need lead users. We need somebody to take the risk, to take the initiative and buy the first. Once that happens, we get a lot of early adopters and we, and, and we see an exponential growth in our market. But then eventually our patents run out, other people copy, other people improve, and we go over the curve. On the supply side of innovation, so on the innovator side, basically it starts with we do R&D and create new knowledge. But only if we know there is an important need that society, business, customers want. We see that first and we head towards that and we continually recycle around that. That's where we create value. Where innovation occurs is where we make a profit and we impact and we change business models. And then eventually we get up here and we've reached that peak of the demand. And so in any business, it leads to what I call strategic inflection points. So we start with our first idea, we push it into the market, accelerate production, and we have to start developing new products and new ideas before this one's reached its peak. And then we have to go again. So it's not enough to be innovative once in your career. You have to innovate and innovate and innovate over and over again, but it's, it takes courage. At this point here, life is good. You make, because at this point here, life is tough. You are in poverty. <laughs> it's a, it's, it takes a lot of courage to run an innovative company. So that's what I call the continuous innovation cycle. You either have to have creative destruction, so in other words, let your own products actually be taken over by your next product, so this continuous innovation, which basically everybody else is now doing it as well. Therefore, it's destroying market value of companies because they didn't keep innovating and others did. And therefore, the failure to innovate leads to extinction. And, and, and the way you measure that, this is a, a years since uh, the American stock market was formed, and this is the average life of an S&P, so this is this uh, 500 medium to big companies in the US, the average life over time. So a company that was formed 50 years ago lasted 75 years. Today, a company that's formed is going to last 15 years and going down. So let's look at Nokia versus Apple. 
Nokia, the company, the Finnish company, is worth in 2000, the year 2000, $250 billion. Today, 29. So the value of Nokia has gone down by a factor of 10. Apple. In 2000, Apple is worth 0 0.5 billion, less, $400 million. Today, 505 billion has gone up by a factor of 1,000. Now, these guys hung on to robust, lightweight, long battery life. End of story. Limited functionality. These guys turn the, turn the, the mobile device into a fashion item, a way of life, um, just a whole cultural transition for particularly young people. That, that was innovation. Not just technology, l actually changing the way you look at something. A couple of things to say about uh, uh, developing new products. It takes a lot of time, a lot of finance, a lot of time. Uh, you've got to start with the need. So Steve Jobs started with a vision. Um, for young, but, but see, these days, when I go to teach a class at UQ, so many people in the class say, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to be an innovator. Trouble is, they have no idea what that means. <laughs> it takes a lot of time, a lot of investment. Uh, it takes incredible patience. So we get the success rates are far from assured. Most great ideas and businesses actually fail virtually before they start. And less than 20% of R&D delivers any return to a funder. I want to talk about in innovation for the energy sector because this, the challenge we spelt out in the, in the previous lecture is just so enormous and so frightening if you actually stop to think about the worst, the worst implications of climate change and countries like Indonesia will be affected seriously in particularly some parts, then we need that innovation in that sector to start happening right now. Here's a, a curve for renewable technologies. So here's um, the next generation of solar PV, nanostructured. This will allow more efficiency um, so we get more power out of a unit area of solar PV. So all of these are in the early stages of development. Some are research, some are development, as we go up here, what's actually happening, because this, what this here is, is the anticipated cost of full-scale applications. So why is it then that when we're coming from here, at the research phase, the cost is lower than at the demonstration phase? The only people working on it are researchers in laboratories that have no idea about what it costs to produce stuff at large scale. And then as we learn more, we realise, oh, it actually costs a lot more than we think. When we get to here and we're demonstrating, we know what it's cost because we just built the first one at large scale. And from there, we learn. We learn how to do it better. We get more and more competition joining the market as the technology matures until we get down into mature technology. Hydro is the only mature uh, renewable technology. But if we had non-renewables in there, we would see coal and gas and things like that back here. CCS sits up here somewhere, still early days. And so at this point, the technology is ready. And at this point, it's commercially ready. The business model is there and ready to be deployed. I can't go and, if I build a power station that's 1,000 gigawatts, I can't go and just decide I want a new one or a different one or a different colour or a different fuel a year. It's a 50-year investment. So it's a very different scenario investing in, in innovation in legacy se sectors. Uh, I will give you a couple examples of innovating on the cheap. Generally, we think it has to be new. Sometimes there are great innovations right there in front of us. Sometimes we, we have things that we tried before and failed because the timing wasn't right. The market didn't need it or didn't appreciate it. Uh, its price wasn't right or the appeal wasn't there. So this ambient experience for healthcare is an innovation of Philips Electronics. So they were a leader in MRI, CT imaging. What they invested in is 
more and more powerful machines to improve resolution, to reduce the time. Billions was invested, right? And they made enormous breakthroughs. But eventually, the leaders of Philips said, you know, we're spending billions and billions of dollars, but it, we're not making any difference in our market share. And as soon as we get ahead, someone else is ahead. And go out and think about a different way for us to make better market penetration. And basically they said, explore new product offerings that don't involve huge am amounts of, of uh, power or, or investment. Go and think about what the market wants. So what did they do? In, the, in, in each of the sectors, healthcare, lighting, consumer electronics, they set up multidisciplinary teams. So in the healthcare sector, they basically got social scientists, nurses, doctors, electricians, uh, engineers in a room and, and, and got them to brainstorm and then went out into the field and tried to understand what actually was the biggest problem for these. So what they did is they said, we're going to create a more relaxing atmosphere for the, for the child. And they set up LED displays, video animations, uh, radio frequency, so they could sense the kids' thing and they could change the music to suit. Um, you know, made the walls nicer and just more friendly and so forth, specifically for kids. And they got a 20% reduction in scan time, so far more than the previous 10 years of massive investment in power. They got 30% less children under, under three who needed sedation and they reduced the radiation received by those kids by 50%. Revolutionary. No change to the actual technology. So, it's a good time to wrap up. I think we're really at the end of our time. You are all future innovators. Don't forget that. You can change the future. You have to change the future. The energy sector needs social scientists, as well as all sorts of disciplines.